Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Former Hillary Clinton campaign lawyer Michael Sussman is found not guilty of lying to the FBI. This was the first case brought to trial by special counsel John Durham. Well, I think none of us are surprised and have followed this closely because we've seen just how rotten Washington, D.C. has become. President Biden today lays out his three-point plan to tackle inflation ahead of his upcoming meeting with the chairman of the Federal Reserve. What are Biden's solutions for tackling soaring prices, and can we expect them to yield results? He's trying to adjust expectations. It's undeniable now that the economy is slowing. Several more threats made against schools since the elementary school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, sparking concerns of copycat actors. Among those arrested, a 10-year-old Florida boy, as police show that no threat or suspect is too small to take seriously. As the school year draws to a close, a survey says 90 percent of teachers are burned out. Excessive workload and students' behavioral challenges are some of the issues. How many teachers will return to class next year? And a vocal constitution advocate is advancing his goal of reducing the federal government's power and putting it in the hands of the states. He's been at it since 2013. Because they believe that government close to the people is better. A jury in Washington, D.C. today found former Hillary Clinton campaign lawyer Michael Sussman not guilty of lying to the FBI. This was the first courtroom test of special counsel John Durham since he got appointed three years ago. Here are the details. The federal jury on Tuesday found unanimously that Michael Sussman is not guilty after a two-day deliberation and a 10-day trial. Special counsel John Durham had charged Sussman with lying to the government. Mr. Durham, are you going to go after Rodney Joffe after this is over? According to Durham, when Sussman brought derogatory information about then-presidential candidate Donald Trump and Russia to the FBI before the 2016 election, he said he was not acting on behalf of a client. But Sussman later acknowledged that he was a lawyer for the Hillary Clinton campaign. Sussman says he didn't lie to the FBI. I told the truth to the FBI, and the jury rec clearly recognized that with their unanimous verdict today. I'm grateful to the members of the jury for their careful and thoughtful service. Despite being falsely accused, I'm relieved that justice ultimately prevailed in my case. This was the first case brought by Durham. He was appointed during the Trump administration to probe the origins of the Trump-Russia hoax. Durham refused to answer reporter questions coming out of the court, but he said in a written statement, while we are disappointed in the outcome, we respect the jury's decision and thank them for their service. Former Congressman Devin Nunes, who's now the CEO of Trump Media, tells NTD why he thinks the jury ruled this way. I think none of us are surprised that have followed this closely because we've seen just how rotten Washington, D.C. has become. You have a situation there where you have a jury that, from a jury pool that less than 5% voted for Trump, and you had a defense who very successfully painted this as a very political, anti-Trump, uh, issue, you know, calling it a conspiracy theory. Former President Trump responded to the verdict on Truth Social, saying our legal system is corrupt. Our judges and justices are highly partisan, compromised, or just plain scared. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. In a message to the American people that inflation is being dealt with, President Biden today met with the Federal Reserve Chairman at the White House and laid out a three-point plan to lower prices. What are economists saying about this plan and our overall economic outlook? NTD's Melina Weiskup reports. Consumer prices are up 8.3 percent from last year, and gas prices are still hitting record highs nearly every day. The economic output for the first quarter was negative, meaning that the economy is shrinking and inflation is outpacing income growth. All of these numbers are moving in the wrong direction. It's not just that we're seeing slower growth. We actually right now are seeing negative growth. So this is going to be a wealth erosion and a quality of life erosion likely for years to come now. The numbers are grim, but Biden says it won't last forever, calling this a transition phase. And, uh, and the, in order to transition from historic recovery <clears throat> to a steady growth that works for American families. 
The president warned that job growth is expected to slow, writing in the op-ed that, quote, this won't be cause for concern. Rather, if average monthly job creation shifts in the next year from current levels of 500,000 to something closer to 150,000, it will be a sign that we are successfully moving to the next phase of recovery. He's trying to adjust expectations. It's undeniable now that the economy is slowing. It's undeniable that, that people um, are really feeling a financial squeeze. And he's trying to paint this as normal. It's not normal. And there's not a need for it. You know, the president in the op-ed today in the Wall Street Journal talked about, for instance, our, our energy problems, the soaring gas costs. I read it twice, and there's no mention of actually increasing production of oil and natural gas, of which we have hundreds of years worth here in this country. The president said Tuesday that getting these prices down is his top priority. My plan is to address inflation. It starts with a simple proposition. Respect the Fed. Respect the Fed's independence. That's part one of his three-part plan laid out in an op-ed article in the Wall Street Journal. Parts two and three of his plan are to push Congress to pass pieces of his Build Back Better bill, like clean energy tax credits and raising taxes on the wealthy in an attempt to lower the federal deficit. Uh, well, he almost had his finger on something accurate here, and that is that all the deficit spending that we've seen over the past years has been a... Um, a contributing factor, if not the leading factor behind the inflation. The Federal Reserve is expected to hike interest rates again this summer as a way to dampen the effects of inflation, but they must be careful not to tip the economy into a recession. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. President Biden and New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern today discussed the need to step up engagement with Pacific Island nations, including through in-person exchanges with their leaders. I have a lot to do, and I want to emphasize the last point you made, working together. We are not coming to dictate or lay down the law. We, we have more work to do in those Pacific Islands as well. Greeting Ardern in the Oval Office, Biden said Washington had no desire to dictate to the region, but to partner with them. Biden and Ardern met at the White House amid a concerted push by China to increase its influence in the Pacific Island region. This has raised concerns in both New Zealand and the United States and among other U.S. allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific. K-pop group BTS is visiting the White House and meeting with President Biden. They joined the press secretary's daily briefing today to celebrate Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and to speak against anti-Asian hate. We are devastated by the recent hate crimes, including Asian American hate crimes. To put a stop to this and to support the cause, we'd like to take this opportunity to express ourselves once again. The band says they are here to stand with the Asia-Pacific community and celebrate their shared heritage. They also spoke about unifying power of their music and thanked their fans. The group didn't take any questions and their meeting with Biden was closed to reporters. According to an earlier White House press release, the purpose of the meeting was to discuss Asian inclusion and representation and to address anti-Asian hate crimes and discrimination. And the school year is wrapping up and both kids and educators will catch a breather. But how many teachers will actually come back next fall? Some reports raise the possibility of an educator shortage. And TV's Jason Perry has the story. Two of the reasons behind the teacher shortage are behavioral challenges caused by students coming back to class after the pandemic and excessive workloads for teachers due to staff shortages. According to a survey done by GBAO Strategies, 55% of teachers are now planning to leave their profession ahead of schedule. Former superintendent, educator, and counselor Gary Marks told the Epic Times that a general lack of respect for educators is one of the factors behind the teacher shortage. And the shortage is not only an issue of trying to keep existing educators and hiring new ones. A new report from the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education says that university students pursuing teaching degrees are declining. Also, according to the GBAO Strategy Survey, 90% of teachers say the solution to fix teacher burnout are increasing educator salary, providing additional mental health support for students, hiring more teachers, and having less paperwork. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. 
Since the Uvalde school shooting last week, several more threats have been made against schools, sparking concerns of copycat actors. And while authorities determined that some of the reported threats were meant as jokes, one sheriff is showing that no threat or suspect is too small to take seriously. NTD's Grace Coulter has the details. A 10-year-old Florida boy has been charged for allegedly threatening to commit a mass shooting at his elementary school in Cape Coral. Despite his young age, officers took his alleged threat seriously. Daniel Isaac Marquez was arrested Saturday. Lee County Sheriff's Office posted a video to Facebook showing the fifth grader being lit off with his hands cuffed behind his back. Facebook users overwhelmingly supported the move. Top comments gaining hundreds of likes, saying while the 10-year-old's arrest is unfortunate, it's necessary to teach him a lesson and potentially prevent future shootings. Sheriff Carmine Marcino wrote on Twitter, Right now is not the time to act like a little delinquent. It's not funny. This child made a threat and now he's experiencing real consequences. Another Florida man was arrested for allegedly making an online threat just one day after the youngster. According to Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, 18-year-old Tampa resident Corey Anderson posted a photo with a rifle, handgun and tactical vest along with a caption reading, Hey Siri, directions to the nearest school. After an investigation, it was determined the photos were actually of airsoft guns. In a news release, Sheriff Chad Cronister said this man intentionally instilled fear into our community as a sick joke. Anderson has been charged with making a written or electronic threat to conduct a mass shooting or act of terrorism. And last week, just two days after the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, which left 19 students and two teachers dead, law enforcement reported another threat. The Donna Police Department in Texas arrested four males, including two minors, on Thursday. The group was allegedly planning to carry out an attack against an unspecified Donna school. Police charged two 17-year-olds with conspiracy to commit aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Grace Coulter, NTD News. Since 2013, a grassroots organization has been lobbying states to pass a resolution that would allow them to apply to Congress for a place and time to meet. It's called the Convention of States, and under Article 5 of the Constitution, the states would have the power to propose amendments to the Constitution. NTD's Arlene Richards finds out more about what the convention is and how it can change our federal government. Founders didn't intend Mark Meckler, president of Convention of the States, says that states have been passing resolutions and making applications to Congress since the beginning of this country. But in order to call for a Convention of the States, it takes 34 states to agree on what the convention will be about. And so far, none of them have been able to agree until recently. So us being here at 19 states on the way to 34 puts us way ahead of where anybody else has been or, you know, in all of these efforts in all of American history. Again, there have been over 400 distinct applications for a convention of states. The key is to aggregate them or make them all the same. So that's what we're focused on. His organization proposed three subject matter areas to state legislatures in a model draft resolution. So far, 19 states have passed resolutions. North Carolina is the latest state to consider the proposed resolution. In May 2021, the House passed the resolution by a vote of 60 to 57. Only one Democrat voted in favor of the resolution, with 10 Republicans opposing. It is now being considered by a Senate committee. So what are the proposed issues? Fiscal restraints on the federal government, term limits on federal officials, and limits on the federal government's jurisdiction. Meckler said fiscal restraints would include a balanced budget amendment, imposing tax caps and spending caps, and imposing generally accepted accounting principles on the Federal Reserve. We have a budget uh, deficit every year. We have long-term debt of currently over $30 trillion. To be frank, nobody even knows how much $30 trillion is. No human being can wrap their head around that. The real also, the federal government's jurisdiction was originally limited to 17 enumerated powers, but the judiciary has helped to expand those powers through its interpretation of the Constitution. In an opinion article in The Hill criticizing the Convention of States, David A. Super said the convention is dangerous because such a convention could veer in dangerous and unpredictable directions, especially in this toxic political atmosphere. 
But Meckler thinks the founders intended for people to have close relationships with state representatives. That is because they believe that government close to the people is better. If the North Carolina Senate passes the resolution, 20 states will be calling for a convention. Meckler said he will continue to work to build grassroots numbers and teach them how to lobby their legislators. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. U.S. Border Patrol making a significant bust over three days. Agents are being praised for stopping violent criminals and drugs from entering the country. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more. U.S. Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortiz says he's extremely proud of the work his agency is doing. In a three-day bust, Border Patrol agents managed to seize 13 pounds of meth, 26 pounds of heroin, and 131 pounds of fentanyl. Fentanyl is a potent opioid estimated to be over 100 times stronger than morphine. It's often cut into other drugs and linked to recent spikes of overdose deaths in the U.S. Over the three days, agents also stopped 10 sex offenders, three gang members, one assassination suspect, and one fugitive wanted for murder. Ortiz says 18 large groups with close to 2,500 migrants were brought in and 22 water rescues conducted. According to Ortiz, three agents were assaulted during the busts. During a recent trip to the border in Texas, Senator Roger Marshall and sheriffs from Kansas rode along with Border Patrol agents to see the situation firsthand. Agents pulled over a car smuggling illegal migrants. Once pulled over, the passengers tried to run away, but were brought back by Border Patrol. One woman was showing severe symptoms of dehydration and heat exhaustion. Senator Marshall, who is a doctor, was concerned about her going into heat stroke and helped cool her down. Marshall gave her water, checked her for injuries, and helped calm her. He says that Border Patrol agents are the real heroes for doing this work under difficult conditions every day. He calls the situation an unsustainable humanitarian crisis and blames the policies of President Biden. Marshall says agents told him they need to get back to the policies of the Trump era and finish building the border wall. The senator is calling for Biden to visit the border to see the crisis for himself. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Coming up, some people may have had a little too much fun over the Memorial Day weekend. Police in California were on the lookout, busting nearly 1,000 people throughout the state for driving under the influence. And California's primary elections are coming up. Which seats are up for grabs? Who are the front runners? And what are the key issues? We'll have all the details for you here on NTD News. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. While Memorial Day weekend was a vacation for many, it was a busy time for California Highway Patrol officers. Despite reminding people to keep their eyes on the road and hands on the wheel, officers still made hundreds of arrests for traffic violations. Every Memorial Day weekend, the California Highway Patrol enacts a maximum enforcement period. This lasts from 6 p.m. Friday to 11.59 p.m. Monday. During this time, CHP officers patrol the state monitoring the roadways for seatbelt violations, distracted drivers, speeding, and anyone suspected of driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. But despite reminding Californians to follow traffic rules, officers busted 891 people for driving under the influence over the weekend. And according to the CHP, 15 people have died along California's roadways since the start of Memorial Day weekend. CHP Commissioner Amanda Ray said, Memorial Day should be a time for honoring our fallen heroes and spending time with loved ones. It should never be marked by tragedy caused by car crashes. Please buckle up, follow all traffic laws, and arrive at your destination safely. Fortunately, this year's numbers are down from last year. 
In 2021, CHP officers made 979 DUI arrests and reported 35 people having died in crashes during last year's Memorial Day maximum enforcement period. Last year, 63% of vehicle occupants killed in crashes were not wearing seat belts. The FDA announced a potential cause for the sudden string of hepatitis A cases in the country: organic strawberries. So far, a majority of the cases have been in California. NTD's Jackie Rios has what kind of strawberries should be thrown away, and some responses from the community. Officials with the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, are investigating a hepatitis A outbreak, potentially linked to fresh organic strawberries. To stay safe, here's what you need to know. The FDA announced that any consumers who bought and later froze strawberries between March 5th and April 25th may have potentially dangerous fruit. The two listed brands were Fresh Campo and HEB. Stores including Aldi, Kroger, Safeway, Sprouts, Trader Joe's, and Walmart sold the fruit nationwide. The FDA recommends that anyone who purchased and ate the strawberries in the last two weeks and who hasn't been vaccinated against hepatitis A should consult or visit with a healthcare professional as quickly as possible. At the Good Fortune supermarket in Los Angeles County, employees said they hadn't heard about any cases. Customers already had the right idea. So if I were made aware that the strawberries are contaminated, I would either take them back to the store or um, throw them away. I would probably just throw them out、um, and go to the store and get a refund. I would throw them out. Do the same thing. I would not want to keep them in my house. Seventeen cases of hepatitis A have been documented nationwide. Fifteen of those cases were in California. The FDA has not warned against strawberries being sold right now. Only frozen strawberries may still be affected, as the potentially hazardous non-frozen fruit have since expired. Jackie Rios, NTD News, Los Angeles. The Golden State's primary elections are coming up. The race for California's U.S. Senate seat is heating up, with debates over topics like crime, vaccine mandates, and the border crisis. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more. California's primary election will take place on June 7th. The state uses a jungle primary system. It's a free-for-all system that includes all candidates, regardless of party affiliation. The top two candidates with the most votes will face each other in November's general election. Democratic Senator Alex Padilla is campaigning in two separate races for the same U.S. Senate seat, and is endorsed by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and California Governor Gavin Newsom, among others. Newsom appointed Padilla to fill the Senate seat left vacant by Vice President Kamala Harris in 2020. In order to keep that seat for the remainder of his current term ending in 2023, he must defeat seven opponents in a special election. For the next full six-year Senate term, Padilla faces over 20 challengers in the top two primary election. Candidates include six Democrats, ten Republicans, and four Independents. Republican frontrunners in the race are Mike Moiser, Cordy Williams, and John Ellis. Moiser is campaigning on fighting for parental rights, local control of education, and cracking down on crime. Padilla is facing increasing criticism from Republican candidates. He has advocated for immigration reform, lax border security policies, and sanctuary cities. He also pushed to end Title 42, decrease funding for federal immigration enforcement, and increase social safety benefits for illegal aliens in the Biden administration's infrastructure plan. A harsh critic of former President Donald Trump, Padilla calls Trump's border wall racist, offensive, and an expensive failure. Padilla's Republican opponents don't see the enforcement of immigration laws as a racial issue, but instead a legal one hinging on the rule of law. On the topic of vaccine mandates, Padilla has called for a more aggressive campaign to get school-aged children vaccinated against COVID-19. Padilla has pushed for vote-by-mail ballots, automatic voter registration, same-day registration, online registration, and expanded early voting. California's major cities have seen a sharp rise in crime, drug addiction, and homelessness. Issues Padilla has been mostly silent on. Many law enforcement agencies and critics have blamed the policies of progressive district attorneys and criminal justice reforms. Cordy Williams has suggested Congress may need to get the FBI and DEA involved to reduce crime in California. In the gubernatorial race, Newsom is running for re-election after winning a recall election in 2021. He is expected to serve a second and final four-year term. Republican Brian Dalle is being touted as his most prominent opponent.
Also up for grabs in the primary are the positions of mayor in Los Angeles and San Jose and district attorney in San Francisco. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, Beijing is stepping up its COVID-19 restrictions in multiple districts. And the resulting medical delays are causing serious consequences. And in the NHL, the Western Conference Finals start tonight with the Oilers and Avalanche facing off. But can either team beat the Lightning in the finals? NTD's Dave Martin breaks down the remaining teams when we return. China before communism. Behold, a splendid culture reborn, filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Come see the performance that has touched the hearts of millions, live on stage. Coming to Jones Hall, June 3rd through the 5th. Shenyun.com slash Houston, 877-663-7469. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. In every country, communism gains power. Authoritarianism and death followed in its wake. As an investigative journalist, I want to understand why. Beijing is stepping up its COVID-19 restrictions in multiple districts, and the resulting medical delays are causing serious consequences. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has the story. Beijing is taking its antivirus restrictions a step further. In the city's Fengtai district, an announcement ordered residents to suspend non-essential travel and movement. The order takes effect Tuesday and lasts until Monday, but may be extended. The announcement also mandates working from home and says communities in the district should be put under a sealed lockdown. Another of Beijing's districts, Haidian, released a similar announcement on Tuesday. On top of the work-from-home requirements, district authorities say they're locking down all communities and deploying a 24-hour guard. These enforcers will monitor the flow of residents and vehicles locally. The district also closed all of its public venues, leaving only grocery stores and some restaurants open to provide food and takeout services. But with strict lockdowns come consequences. A father shared his family's tragedy on social media, saying that his son died after waiting 54 minutes for an ambulance. According to the Post, the man was struck by a heart attack and called 120, the Chinese version of 911. But several hospitals refused to treat him, citing the local health restrictions. By the time he was accepted by a hospital three miles away, it was too late. Another patient, this time an 80-year-old woman, endured similar medical delays. She developed a gastric perforation or a hole in the lining of the stomach and needed emergency surgery. But the hospital required her to take a COVID-19 test before treating her. The woman got tested on site, which came back negative. 
but the hospital then asked to check her digital health code for confirmation. The readouts are accessed via smartphone and are part of China's contact tracing system. But a tech glitch slowed the process even further. By the time she went into surgery, it had been more than six hours since she arrived at the emergency room. The patient is currently in the intensive care unit. Over the long weekend, actor Tom Cruise's long-awaited Top Gun Maverick made its global debut and pulled in a projected $151 million in the U.S. That's the biggest opening weekend haul of the star's career. Interestingly, the stellar debut is actually without the Russian and Chinese markets. It seems Paramount isn't planning to show the movie in China. Chinese tech firm Tencent recently withdrew its investment from the film. Insiders say it's afraid of being linked with a movie that promotes the American military. Tom Cruise may have pulled off one of the greatest feats of his career. Top Gun Maverick, the long-awaited sequel to his 1986 blockbuster original, opened to a projected $151 million over the four-day Memorial Day weekend in the U.S., making it the highest-grossing film debut of his career and his first to surpass $100 million on an opening weekend. Credit dazzling reviews, loads of nostalgia, and Cruz's return to the cockpit as Navy pilot Pete Maverick Mitchell, the actor telling Reuters the role is truly one he relishes. I have such a passion and love for aviation. We just had a lot of fun. Top Gun Maverick was scheduled to open the summer of 2020 until the health crisis scrambled those plans. Moviegoers who flocked to the original, namely people now over 40, turned out in force which is impressive given that that demographic has been the most reluctant to return to theaters. Distributor Paramount Pictures hopes the film's strong word of mouth helps attract those not yet born when the original opened 36 years ago. In Top Gun 2, a patch featuring the Taiwanese flag appears on Tom Cruise's jacket. But even without the chance to screen in China, Doctor Strange 2 and Top Gun 2 are already hitting impressive box office numbers. The shift hints that China's sizable movie market may be less critical for a film's success compared to its curbs on depictions of freedom and democracy. And now for your sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. The NHL's Western Conference Finals start tonight with Colorado hosting Edmonton. The series stars two of the best players in the league, an avalanche forward Nathan McKinnon and Oilers forward Connor McDavid. McKinnon is a five-time All-Star, while McDavid, who led the league in points for the second straight season, is looking for his third Hart Trophy. Neither team has made it this far in years. Colorado last advanced to the conference finals in 2002, while Edmonton was last here in 2006, en route to the Stanley Cup Finals. Meanwhile, the Eastern Conference Finals start Wednesday, with the Rangers set to host the Lightning. New York won Game 7 last night in Carolina 6-2. Rangers goalie Igor Shesterkin made 37 saves as the outcome was really never in doubt. They'll have their hands full with the two-time defending champions though, who've already knocked off two of the league's top four teams. Tampa Bay has now won 10 straight playoff series while looking for their third straight championship. No team has won three in a row since the Islanders won four straight to start the 80s. At the French Open today, 18-year-old Coco Gauff advanced to her first ever Grand Slam semifinal with a straight sets win over fellow American Sloane Stephens. Gauff, who lost at this stage of the French Open a year ago, has yet to drop a set this time around. Gauff could be joined in the semis by fellow American Jessica Pagula, though Pagula will have her hands full with top-ranked Iga Sviatek. Sviatek has won 32 straight matches, resulting in five straight tournament championships. Her winning streak is the longest on the women's side since Serena Williams won 34 straight in 2013. On the men's side, third seed Alexander Zverev, top 19-year-old sensation Carlos Alcarez in four sets. Zverev, who was runner-up at the 2020 U.S. Open, will face the winner of the Nadal-Djokovic match. Meanwhile, Alcarez drops to 32-4 on the season with a tour leading four tournament titles. In the NBA, Philadelphia 76ers center Joel Embiid had surgery Monday to repair the right thumb he sprained during the playoffs. He also had a procedure done to fix his left index finger, an injury not previously disclosed. Embiid is expected to be healthy in time for training camp, which starts in early September. 
The seven footer also suffered a concussion and facial fracture this postseason, yet somehow missed only two games as Philly lost in the second round. Embiid, who's finished runner-up in the MVP voting the past two years, has dealt with a number of injuries in his career, including a broken bone in his foot that caused him to miss his first two seasons. The 28-year-old played in a career-high 68 games this year and led the league in scoring for the first time ever. That's all for your sports today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And coming up, the European Union agrees to cut 90% of Russian oil imports, aiming to cut down Russia's ability to finance the war in Ukraine. The EU plans to cut the remaining 10% in the future. And French President Emmanuel Macron is calling for a stronger World Health Organization, one that could decide on health policies rather than just recommend them. But critics say that could do more harm than good. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What did today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. European Union leaders have reached an agreement in principle to cut 90% of oil imports from Russia by the end of this year. This deal would allow other elements of a sixth sanctions package against Russia to move forward. Here's more. The European Union pledged to enforce an oil embargo against Russia late on Monday, an agreement in principle that solved a deadlock with Hungary and the toughest effort yet to sanction Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Thanks to this, um, Council should now be able to finalize a ban on almost 90 percent of all Russian oil imports by the end of the year. European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen told the news conference after day one of a two-day summit the leaders of the 27 EU nations agreed to come back and discuss the remainder 10 percent as soon as possible. For now, the deal exempts 10 percent of oil from the ban so that Hungary, a landlocked country, as well as Slovenia and the Czech Republic, have access to a southern Russian pipeline. Hungary was the main holdout for a deal. All three countries said the fuel from that pipeline was difficult to replace. European Council President Charles Michel tweeted the move against Russia cuts, quote, a huge source of financing for its war machine, maximum pressure on Russia to end the war. It now clears the way for other parts of the EU's sixth and toughest sanctions package against Moscow to take effect. This includes cutting Russia's biggest bank, Sberbank, from the SWIFT messaging system and barring EU companies from providing a range of services to Russian firms. It also blocks three Russian state media outlets from broadcasting in the EU. Ukrainian forces are resisting Russia's all-out assault on a key city in Luhansk province, and both sides admit Russian troops now control up to half of the city. Russia-backed separatists in Donetsk sent out a ship loaded with thousands of tons of steel from Mariupol to Russia, with Ukraine saying this amounts to looting. NTD's Eddie Aitken has more. Ukrainian forces were holding out in a small industrial city in the Luhansk region on Tuesday resisting Russia's all-out assault. Both sides said Russian forces now controlled between a third and half of Severodonetsk, the principal objective of its invasion in recent days. Russia's separatist proxies acknowledged that capturing it was taking longer than hoped, despite one of the biggest ground assaults of the war. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Monday night, the situation in the eastern region of Donbass remains extremely difficult. The Russian army is trying to gather a superior force to put more and more pressure on our defenders. There in Donbas, the maximum combat power of the Russian army is now gathered. Russian Defense Ministry released footage of a cargo ship leaving the Ukrainian port of Mariupol for the first time since Russia seized the city. Denis Pushilin, the Russian-backed separatist leader in the self-claimed Donetsk People's Republic, said the ship loaded with 2,500 tons of steel rolls 
was headed to Russia. Ukraine said this action amounted to looting. Pushilin also said his administration would take over some of the ships in the port of Mariupol. Some of the vessels will come under the jurisdiction of the Donetsk People's Republic. The relevant decisions have been made. The Russian Defense Ministry said its forces had discovered over 150 bodies of Ukrainian fighters in the underground tunnels of the Avostal steel plant. Moreover, during the inspection of the van, Russian sappers found four mines placed under the bodies of the dead Ukrainian servicemen. The combined mass of explosives in them was sufficient to destroy all the remains of the bodies remaining in the van. A Ukrainian court sentenced two captured Russian soldiers to 11 and a half years in jail for shelling a town in eastern Ukraine. The second war crimes verdict since the start of Russia's invasion in February. Alexander Bobkin and Alexander Ivanov admitted firing at an education facility in a town in the Kharkiv region and both pleaded guilty last week. Under the coordination of the Ukrainian Red Cross, more than a thousand civilians were evacuated to Ukraine-controlled territory on Monday from the east and north of Kharkiv region, where some towns and villages remained under Russian control. On Monday, Russian forces shelled the northern outskirts of Kharkiv, injuring several people and setting houses on fire. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. At the World Health Assembly, French President Emmanuel Macron advocated for the reinforcement of the WHO to better quell any future pandemics. It's a worrying call for some policy analysts who believe this might lead to a loss of sovereignty for individual countries. NTD's France correspondent David Vives has the story. A stronger, more independent WHO. This is what French President Emmanuel Macron called for in the early World Health Assembly in Geneva. This assembly, which is the decision-making body of the WHO, discussed new points regarding the role of the World Health Organization in preparing and coordinating responses to health emergencies. One of these points is the increase of financial support from contributors, those being countries or groups. The contributors are asked to increase their financial support by 20% for the 2022-23 budget. In a message to the assembly, Macron confirmed an increase in France's contribution. He said that the WHO should play the role of coordinating this new directive and that an international agreement to legally restrain countries might also be adopted. There are many proposals which converge on the importance of strengthening the WHO in its role as scientific coordinator and standard setter in a one health approach and on the need to give it more means to act, financial means with larger contributions. In other words, the WHO wouldn't be just making recommendations but might be able to decide on health policies. Author Olivier Piacentini says Although he believes the WHO is useful, giving it new powers over health policies would be harmful. It is necessary for the WHO to coordinate health policies, but it does not have to dictate policies. It can get the heads of states who try to help countries to face their difficulties, to try to quell a pandemic, and to find a compromise. That's one thing. He questions giving the WHO authority to decide other countries' policies. But to have an international body that tells you, ah, this is what you have to do, and everybody complies. That's the development of a global government, at least on health policy. Piacentini says reflects Macron's desire to give more power to global organizations, including the EU. A restrictive agreement might lead to a loss of sovereignty for countries that are part of the WHO, as they would be forced to comply with the organization's policies. Moreover, Piacentini says the WHO isn't neutral. It has ties with China and interests in the country. He questions the conflicts of interest of the WHO Director General, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs for Ethiopia. Ethiopia is completely under Chinese influence. This Mr. Gibriasis is a former Marxist minister and is amazing. Since the beginning of the pandemic, everything has been done to cover up, to hide, minimize and exonerate the Chinese government from all its responsibilities regarding the initial outbreak and spread of the virus. As for the WHO's future role, 
There are also concerns of the collection of people's health data in different countries and the building of a World Health Data Hub with the support of companies such as Microsoft. The collection of data is one of the biggest challenges the WHO faces in order to see through its aims. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Coming up, a mountain resort in Vietnam opens a bridge with a bottom made of glass. It spans a gorge nearly 500 feet below to attract thrill-seeking tourists. And we'll take a look at the largest and oldest outdoor horse show in the country. It's a tradition that locals in Pennsylvania have been preserving for decades. That and more when we return here on NTD News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you get one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and you get a second set absolutely free. Or my six-piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or get my classic premium my pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to MyPillow.com and use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all my pillow products. A mountain resort in Vietnam has opened a unique bridge. With a bottom made of glass, it stretches over a gorge nearly 500 feet below. It's the third such bridge in the Southeast Asian country and has quickly become a hotspot for thrill-seeking tourists. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. The Bok Long Suspension Bridge is in Vietnam's Son La province, northwest of the capital, Hanoi. The name translates as White Dragon and is the world's longest glass-bottomed bridge. According to the official World Record Association, it spans 2,073 feet. I dared not look down as I'm afraid of heights. I imagined in my head what would have happened if I fell through, and it makes me too scared to keep on going. The reinforced glass used for the bridge has three layers, each 1.5 inches thick. The structure can hold up to 450 people at a time. If you look down and walk, it shows you have nerves of steel. At first it makes you panic, but then if you walk over around 10 glass panels, that feeling is gone. After that, it feels solid. The bridge is 951 feet long between two peaks on either side of a gorge, plus a 1,122-foot pathway on the cliffside. Guinness World Records, a different record certifying body from OWR, certified the structure as the world's longest glass bottom cliffside pathway. The now recorded longest glass bottom cliffside pathway, and it's spectacular the engineering required to build that into the side of a cliff but maintain all the features of nature, the greenery, the rock, has been an amazing project, very successful, and I think it will attract a lot of tourists. Guinness lists a 1,843-foot glass-bottomed bridge in China as the world's longest glass bridge. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And lastly, we take you to the country's largest outdoor multi-breed horse show. The Devon Horse Show and Country Fair is going on now in Pennsylvania. Here's more. Philadelphia's Horse Show, the Devon Horse Show and County Fair, an artifact from 1896. As far as outdoor multi-breed horse shows go, this is the largest and oldest show in the country. For 11 days, hundreds of horses and thousands of guests lined the streets of Pennsylvania. Some locals like John Rice and his wife have been preserving this tradition for 20 years. Hackney horses on a country turnout, wagonette carriage, uh, reproduction carriage, made to look old. So I take care of the horses um, and clean, up, clean all the harness and everything. The carriage component kicked off this week with a marathon event. The variety of horses and ponies collect for preliminary judging before setting off on a drive through the streets of Pennsylvania. 
They conclude the drive at the Dixon Oval Showground, where they are pinned according to their placement. And we're going out drive today, and then we're heading to the Dixon Oval. The event brings in judges of international standing who judge the horses, ponies, four-wheel coaches, two-wheel coaches, down to the whips and harnesses. The coaches are judged on the history of the vehicle, maintenance of the vehicle, as well as the appropriate dress of the passengers. Tomorrow, Monday through Friday, there will be a series of events in each category of coaching uh, and judging that will take place on the showgrounds every evening, concluding with Friday night, which will be the Grand Champions Award. Even the onlookers are judged on layout of their picnic. Each individual element of the event has become a point of interest for the onlookers and partakers alike. The event has become an educational and historical program that has passed on through the generations from grandparents to parents and now to the children. A young lad from the local area, Henry Timmerman, said he enjoys the show because... You get to see old, like older things that you don't get to see every day. 126 years later, the Devon Horse Show and County Fair shows that Philadelphia is not a one-horse town. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.